Okay. Welcome everyone. The time is now 6.35 p.m. It's April 3rd. Welcome to the Landmarks Preservation and Parks Committee meeting. We are being recorded. And we're just going to check the attendance one more time for our committee members and everyone who has joined the call. Please be so kind as to sign your name and email address um, or your um, affiliation into the chat mm -hmm. to ensure that you receive um, email mailings from us and information about additional meetings and information. So please sign into the chat. So we will go ahead and okay, I'm looking through the attendance to see. Okay, we have a Jindu. So please sign into the chat. Okay, so we now have um Yeah. Do we have I think we Yes, yeah, so we'll go ahead and call the meeting to order at 6 37 p.m. Um, it appears that we do have a quorum of yeah. expected members. But they're not on it yet. Yes. Um, the only person that we're missing is is April Adams. Mm -hmm. But I see Pat Patricia is on. Um, Liz is on. Liz, can you just verify that you're on? White tickets. <laughs> I'm here, Heather. Okay. And Annette and I are on, and Alyssa is, or, you know, Alyssa is also on. So we call the meeting to attention, uh, or call the meeting to order at 6.37 p.m. Is there a motion to adopt the minutes, the, the not the minutes, the agenda? Um, with any changes, we're unable to adopt the minutes because we don't have the minutes mm -hmm. from the last time. So can we have a motion to adopt the agenda with any changes? I do have a change. Um, we're going to move Leslie Wright um, further down in the agenda and she will be joining us a little later. Are there any other changes to the agenda? I move to adopt the agenda with the change to move Leslie down. Thank you so much. And that was Liz, for the record. Yes. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, Mallory, are you on? Yes, hi. Or, or do you want to um, go after Leslie as you normally do, or you want to start now? Does yeah, matter. I'm fine. I'm fine with sharing now. Um, okay, great. Okay, we have Mallory Craig. She's the Greenhouse and Community Gardens Education Director. Uh, sure, manager. <laughs> manager, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, hi. Good evening. Uh, yeah, I have some updates from the greenhouse here. Um, where it's nice and rainy and cozy. We just finished up our um, Wednesday evening class, which I just wanted to remind you all that we have classes um, every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, um, and Saturday that are free and open to the public. We just explored all things dandelion and healing by um, cooking with dandelion greens and eating with dandelion um, leaves. Uh, and yeah, I just am going to drop in the chat for you um, some of the ways to um, find out about our classes and sign up. Again, they're all free and open to the public. Um, right now, we're loving our spring and blooming themes. Um, so you can find out more about those at our website at thehort.org slash events. Um, and I'm also leaving, oh, I'm seeing my the copy of the postcard did not um, 
did not go through, but I'm also leaving the link. I will leave another link of our postcard for our spring programs. And I also wanted to get on your radar um, some of our special events for April. Um, in addition to our regular classes on Saturday, April uh, 13th, we'll be having our seed celebration. So we'll be um, bringing out our mobile apothecary. We'll be singing and storytelling to the seeds. Um, we'll have um, some seed starting. We'll also be doing a giveaway of a seed trays and some seeds and kind of activating our seed library over here. So come anytime um, Saturday, April 13th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And then the very next Saturday, Saturday, April 20th for our Earth Day, um, we're going to be uh, loving up on where water meets earth for our water conservation festival and thinking about how um, our garden space can, um, we can be stewards of um, supporting our waterways and particularly learning, learning about our watersheds. We'll be doing um, drought resistant plant giveaways. We'll be kind of activating rain, gar rain garden strategies. Uh, we'll be having some games. Again, we'll bring out our mobile apothecary, have some fun hydration station, music, food, what have you, all the fun things. Um, so again, that's Saturday, April 20th. Um, and then the last announcement beyond um, my excitement to continue to uh, have you over come to the greenhouse and share um, with the students in your life. We have um, field trips um, still going strong, but we have some openings still left in spring. Um, and those, uh, are, again, uh, anyone in this district, if you have students that you know um, who are looking for a field trip, we're able to offer uh, field trips for free to this district. So you can find us again on that website that I've left in the chat, um, as well as we're uh, starting up, we're just finishing up our uh, winter cohort with our uh, Fort Greenhouse interns, which is um, for Harlem-based young people to learn gardening, food, arts, healing, um, where community coalesces. And so where, if you um, know Harlem-based young people, uh, they can express their interest in the program by um, emailing programs at thehort.org, which I've left in the chat. Uh, and those are the updates I have for you. I will make sure I include that postcard uh, link properly. Thank you. Great, excellent. Um, do we have a representative from New York City Parks, Green Thumb? Uh, Agendo hello. or Alex? Oh, Agendo, hi. Yes. Hi, Heather, how are you doing? Great. Yeah, so I'll be joining tonight. Um, Alex, unfortunately, is under the weather, so he won't be able to join. Uh, I think you could remember uh, back in December, he gave sort of like a overview of some of our gardens here in Community Board 9. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ejindo Obasi, and I am the Community Engagement Coordinator for uh, New York uh, Parks Green Thumb. Um, we have approximately nine gardens in Community Board of Nine, and uh, my primary responsibility is to um, just get the necessary resources to our garden groups to make sure that they can function according to the vision that they have set forth for um, their garden group. Um, our gardens are managed by volunteers, so we encourage garden groups to have at least 10 uh, members in order to share the load of managing entire space. Uh, but that being said, we have resources that we give out throughout the year. We just had a spring supply giveaway this past Saturday, and uh, we have uh, workshops throughout the year. And uh, we're gonna have our annual Grow Together conference, which is gonna be decentralized. Usually it's one in one location, but this year it's in all five boroughs or actually four boroughs. and um, I definitely want to put our link in the chat so you can get update information on our Grow Together conference coming uh, this uh, this month on the 27th in East Harlem. So um, that being said, um, anybody who's interested also in joining a garden group, um, our website has an interactive map that gives you the information of the garden and who the contacts are. So um, please feel free to check out our website in the chat. Excellent. Thank you so much um, for that update and for that information. Does anyone have any questions for Ajindu or for Mallory Craig? Any questions? Okay. 
Um, and we do have um, representatives who are um, existing community gardens um, volunteers. Is anyone on for Edgecombe Avenue Garden Park Sanctuary? Hello. Can you hear me? Oh, Nora. Hi. Thanks, Nora. Hi. <laughs> Okay. Do you want to go ahead and give your announcement now? Sorry to um, make another change to the agenda, but um, since she is one of the representatives from the community garden program, I thought it might be good for her to go ahead and make her announcement now. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nora Cole. I'm with Edgecombe Avenue Garden Park Sanctuary. We're at 339 Edgecombe Avenue across from Jackie Robinson Park, just at around 149th Street. Um, April the 20th and the 27th, um, uh, free art classes are going to be offered in our garden, um, uh, by the artist, uh, Georgie Morell. This is being sponsored by Time Bank by Health First, and the classes are going to be 11 a.m. to 1230. The garden will be open prior and after. Uh, it's free. It's open to the public. Um, anyone under 18 will need um, parental supervision. Supplies are going, this is a drawing class and um, uh, supplies are going to be provided. And it doesn't matter if you, if you don't make the first class and you want to come to the second class or you come to the second class and don't make the first class, it's fine. Um, I should say that um, Time Bank by Health First is the organization we're partnering with. And I want to thank uh, Tanisha Morrison for connecting us and uh, recommending us. We're going to be looking forward to more art classes throughout the summer and even some Tai Chi classes. Uh, Time Bank is a community program. All their activities are free. And um, you you don't have to join uh, their membership to participate in any of their activities. Uh, our contact person there is Jessica Monaco Coppell. We are also going to have the first Saturday in May, we're going to have an open house and we will be getting in touch with Mallory and Stephanie Caban and to the general public, we're going to post on, of course, uh, Green Thumbs website, the community board website, and um, Harlem One Stop to uh, invite the community in to see our garden. I would post a picture if it's possible. This is a beautiful garden that you cannot see into from the street. And uh, there's a reason why we call it a garden park sanctuary. It's always about 10 degrees lighter, uh, cooler there in the summertime uh, because of the shade and how the garden is laid out. Mm -hmm. um, but we are looking for new members. We need new members. Mm -hmm. And that's the point of our open house to invite people in and see the garden, um, meet us and let us um, tell you about us and hopefully you will uh, we will get more people to join us in our efforts. We are an ornamental garden mm -hmm. and um, but we are open to ideas and um, if anybody out there in parks is listening, we do have a situation of needing our the benches and some of the benches in our garden have been there since the 70s and they are they need to be removed. <laughs> And, uh, we Did you want to have... share the quick picture of the garden, Nora? I've given you the opportunity to share. Okay, and let's then... see if I uh, know how to do it. Mm -hmm. Picture. Let's go. And then we'll move, uh, move on. Is that it? Did you not, get yet. It? not yet. Not yet. Did you hit share your screen? Oy, oy, oy. 
Okay, okay. I'm not gonna. So I'm not. not gonna do the okay. Oh. Then we'll move. We'll move on. Um, but I did correct your the address on the agenda, mm -hmm. and you're at West 149th Street. Does anyone have any questions for? Again, Green Thumb or one of the representative community gardens. Um, Heather, I do. Nora, how are you there? I just good. How are you? Good, thank you. Can you repeat the date again for your open house? The open house is the first Saturday in May, which is May the fourth. And from what time? From eleven to two. The garden will be open from 10 to 6 by then. Our open hours on Saturdays are going to be 10 to 6. But uh, we will be there in full force uh, welcoming whoever comes uh, to engage. Okay, well, I'm glad to see that you guys are setting up that um, open house because it is definitely a priority to yes. increase the membership at your garden and to begin to collaborate with the other services that Parks offers. And you may want to consider really probably trying to do more than one open house during your season. Um, oh, yeah. We'll also, because we'll also be participating, uh, Green Thumb has Open Garden Day, and that'll be, I think it's in June. Ejendu, is that right? Uh, so that'll be another date that we'll have. Okay, well, we'll we're going to move. We're going to move on, but you have the opportunity to share that information with our community board offers, so they can make that open house part of the e blast, so we can make this a real community and team effort, as opposed to the onus of what's going on your at your park being solely at the feet of you and Nina. So hopefully we can make some progress with that. Yes, and also I just want to um, just kind of mention, are we gonna have a, a sort of like a meeting where we can inform um, the visitors of, you know, what Green Thumb programming is all about in terms of, you know, the makeup, how decisions are made, things like that. Because, you know, I feel that's something that's very, very important for um, people that, visit the garden that are interested in being members um, should should be privy to. Oh, that 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 information will be there. I mean, we don't want, I mean, people can come anytime during the day, really, but we will be there specifically for that between 11 and two. And, okay. and I so also can... request that you please you... reach out to um, Mallory, um, if you didn't say that already, and Leslie Wright at Riverbank State Park. Um, to find out if there are any people on their wait list for community gardening um, that would also be interested in um, participating in membership at um, the garden that you represent at Edgecombe. Okay. Yeah, we, we will be reaching out specifically to them. Thank you so much for doing that. So we're going to go I ahead. I would also and like to, if I may, uh, Nora, I have long lived um my uh, apartment faces the Edgecombe in the Jackie Robinson Park. I'm familiar with that. I would love to be, I've been here for like 40 years and I'd love to be a part of that that uh, park. I'm also, I also have a flower bed that um, in season when I can do at Jackie Robinson Park right across the street. So I'd like very much to be uh, there again. That is the first weekend in May. The first okay. Saturday in May is the open house. And the time is? 11 to 2. Right. Thank you very much. And the art classes are the April the 20th and the 27th from 11 to 1230. <clears throat> Thank you very much for being with us. And we, I'm very glad to get this information. Thank you. I'm sorry. I don't know who's speaking. My yeah. name is Patricia Caldwell. Patricia. She's one of our please committee forgive, members. I'm please forgive, I have a cold, everybody. I'm not going to talk much, but I wanted to thank you. That is something I've been interested in, and I would love to see the garden. It is one of my loves to see uh, things grow. Okay, great. I'll put my um, contact information in the chat. Okay, I appreciate okay. that. And Zonia, if you know Sonia, 
Yes. Tell her Patricia Caldwell and let her give you my information. Okay. Thank you. Very mm -hmm. good. So we're going to move the agenda along to Riverside Park um, and West Harlem Pierce Park. Is Wesley Hamilton on today? Hi, good evening. Can everybody hear me tonight? Oh, great. Yes. Hey, Wesley. Mm -hmm. Hey, how's everyone doing? Thanks for having me on and uh, thanks for everybody coming out tonight. I just have a few announcements, not a lot, but a couple of things we're happy to, to uh, inform you guys about. Uh, first of all, we'd like to, uh, we're very pleased to welcome our new borough commissioner, uh, Tremisha Shamara. Um, she's been very involved with community boards and, and very uh, familiar with the area. So uh, we hope to bring her on board to have you speak with you or meet with you guys soon. Uh, but we wanted to let you know she is now our new borough commissioner and we're pleased to have her. So that's uh, one thing we like to notice and the note. The other item we wanted to mention, which uh, I believe it was about in January, we mentioned the stairs at 148 that uh, go from Palisades Playground over to 10 Mile Playground, if you're familiar with the area, but that those stairs had uh, been uh, were damaged and were beyond repair. Um, and we're happy to report that, uh, I don't know if it's through the efforts of the community board or whoever, uh, several people involved with the state uh, has jumped in with the DOT, has uh, jumped in and, and and tried to help us with this situation, and it's in repair now. So we were concerned how long it would take to get that uh, repaired, um, but we're pleased to say we expect it to be open now by the summertime. So that's, that's a big thing that we're really happy for because that's um, – a well-used uh, stairway to really transverse from one playground from the other to get to um, from Riverside Drive over to uh, 10 Mile. Um, so, and with that, our last announcement that we mentioned, I mentioned that uh, 142 Dog Run would be going under construction. And so we expect that to be happening um, uh, April 15th. We'll be closing off the Dog Run. Unfortunately, we have to close it to make repairs, uh, but we'll be closing off that area and the area directly behind it um and uh we expect that to be a fairly quick construction but it could be anywhere up to a year that's generally how long we give the contractors but um we're familiar with this contractor and we know he's going to come in and and get things done as soon as possible and get it back open to the public and when it does i think it's going to be uh i think everyone will agree it'll be a much better place once it's once it's completed it's going to be make a lot of improvements in that area so we're happy to state that that's going to be starting this april 15th and with that i'll let stephanie uh, from Riverside Conservancy, uh, talk to you guys about it because I know she probably might have some events planned around that and try to answer if anybody has any questions for me. I have Riverside. questions for you. Sure. Yeah, not, uh, not just Riverside, but I, I uh, first of all, I thank you. You are faithful to to attend the meetings and appreciate and you are much appreciated. Uh, I have a recent question, and this question because you're with the New York New York City Parks. On the corner of the uh, put at the Jackie Robinson Park on the corner of 155th Street, where the fence has been taken down and coming up the steps over there along that way, they have it's been uh, largely complained about uh, we being overrun by raccoons. Raccoons who are emboldened, who sit on the steps. <laughs> um, <laughs> do that move when you come, families. Uh, I'd like to know. Uh, what uh, what is your intention, or did you are you aware of that, and what can be done to uh, 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 control these animals? Because we're being overrun right, right now, and because our children and everybody play with it, we're a little concerned. It, that's a good question. Uh, generally, what I do uh, now, I'm not familiar with that location, uh, and I'll definitely pass it along to uh, uh, my uh, co-workers that. Uh, are familiar with that area. Uh, one may be on tonight, one or two, uh, uh, but uh, I'll make sure that information gets to the, the proper person in parks. And when I have that issue, say for instance, in Riverside, we usually contact our urban park rangers. Uh, they're our specialists in wildlife. Um, but with that being said uh, to the community, we try to educate the community. And um, so I don't want to give the impression that the first thing we're going to do is come and get rid of them. I mean, that's one of the the pros and cons of having parks is we do have wildlife. And um, so usually what they will do is they will probably monitor the area. Uh, may even want to talk to you and find out if, you, if you've if seen any, mainly with raccoons, they're very um, skittish and, and should shy away from people. Uh, if you have seen them in the daytime, 
or if you're seeing them uh, acting uh, uh, irregular, <laughs> then, then that would take no. a different approach. Mm -hmm. But um, well, they will take a look at it. We'll definitely get the word out to our rangers, and uh, we'll make sure that they know about it and can monitor that family of raccoons. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wesley. Um, Patricia, we're going to move the agenda along. Um, no we do. Um, Jackie Robinson Park is um, in Community Board District 10, um, but it is one of our historic parks in the area. And um, we have someone representing the historic parks later in the agenda. Um, so, Stephanie, are you on? It, and I see it looks, like Ira, it looks like Ira has his hand up of a question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, can you hear me? Go ahead, Ira. Okay, yeah, yeah, I wanted to, there's a, in West Harlem, here is Park, uh, on the north of the end, there's a, that Marine Transfer Station has been vacant since 1985, and on the mainland, there's a chain, chain link fenced area that's locked up and not used. I was wondering who I could get in touch with about using that. That property, I believe, is uh, sanitation. Um, I see it every day. So you have a contact uh, the best, for sanitation. The NYC sanitation would be the best contact for that. Is that like NYC sanitation? Just that's the name. Uh, well, New York City uh, Department of Sanitation. Department of sanitation. Okay, okay. I, I don't have a specific person who handles that, um, but that would be the agency that handles that that um, addresses that property. Okay, I will ask. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. And, and Ira, you can also contact the community board or our committee member um, for uniform services who might be able to provide you a contact for that. Okay, I'll do that. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Um, uh, folks, you can I send me an into... email and I can I can follow up um, on your behalf to oh, put you in wonderful. contact yes. with the person. Sure. I, I just jumped into Google and Googled how to contact New York City Sanitation. Um, there's a contact information that pops right up, and they also have, apparently have a Facebook account that they also encourage people to reach out to. So pretty easy to do. Thank you, Shannon. Okay, Stephanie, you're on. Hi, everyone. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Wes, for those updates on 148th Street and the 142 uh, dog run. Um, I know Shannon's on the call. Hello, Shannon. Um, but if you want to follow the dog run, um, just any updates on the dog run, I'm sure that they're going to say a final goodbye to their temporary dog run, their wood chip dog run. Um, you can follow them at dog run 142 on Instagram. Um, they are pretty active on Instagram, so make sure to follow. Um, uh, just a couple of updates. I know we have a lot on the agenda today. Um, Teen Corps, we have a high school internship program um, this summer, every summer. Um, I'm so happy to co-lead it this summer. It's an educational horticultural internship um, for high schoolers in uh, Community Board 9. We've had a lot of applications, which is amazing, but I need more uh, residents of Community Board 9. So again, high schoolers in Community Board 9. Um, you get a $1,000 stipend at the end of the summer, and it's in July and August. I'll drop that info in the chat in a second. Um, we also have a, um, a volunteer opportunity at 143rd Street, which is actually a block away from the dog run, um, to um, just help clean up the community and help clean up that area. It's on 143rd Street the second Tuesday of every month. Um, and uh, we are going to be making an announcement at the general community board meeting for community board nine on April 18th, I believe it is. Um, I sent an email to info at CB9 or, or something of that address, um, something of that email address. I didn't hear anything back, but I'm probably gonna send another email again tomorrow because uh, we're hoping to make an announcement about the goats. The goats are coming back. I cannot share anything more, but you can come to the April 18th general meeting to hear more. Um, but the goats are coming back. Um, so we will be sharing about that at the April 18th general board meeting for community board nine, as well as summer on the Hudson. We have more than 300 free public programs this summer. Um, and we'll be sharing more about that again, um, at general board meeting. So I'll put some of that info down in the chat. And I think that's all I have for today. Great. Does anyone have any questions for Stephanie? Uh, have and a question, but Stephanie, although you sent the information in it to info, uh, community board nine, if you did not get a response, it's just best to call the office. Our aides, Hakeel and Madison, 
they are very helpful and they can give you an on the spot on the spot answer. Okay. Thank you so much, Annette. I'm gonna call them tomorrow morning first thing for sure. <laughs> Great. And, Thank you. Um, I actually had a question, not for Stephanie, but for Ejendu. Yes. Is Ejendu still on? Okay, good. No, I'm still here. Yep. Yeah. What is the current state of composting in New York City? Oh. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I'll probably have to get back to you on that. Um, there's so oh, many I'll different send you an email entities. Like. Yeah, that um, are just ha have their fingers crossed um, in terms of whether or not their funding will continue. And uh, it it's, it varies from region to region. You know, what yeah. uh, the state of composting in Brooklyn is different than it is in, you know, other community boards, say in Manhattan. So, so yeah, it's very... Um, kind of helter skelter in terms of you know the level of composting available to, to residents okay so it's mixed bag that makes sense yes yeah okay uh, and, and actually a question for stephanie um i've been considering recently picking up compost using a bike trailer connected to a regular bike or an e-bike uh but i'm concerned as a community garden would there be insurance required for the trailer, the regular bike, the e-bike, you know, all those modes. Yeah, thanks for that question, Ira. Uh, and thanks for your email as well last week. Um, I definitely think, uh, so yeah, we have Jenny's Garden on 138th Street. That is a community garden, but they also accept compost on Saturdays and Sundays, which is really amazing. Um, <clears throat> and you had sent me an email about, you know, how, how um, uh, what are other possible alternatives for easily picking up um just certain items. Um, let me get back to you on that because I am in sure. talks with my supervisor, Kristen. Yeah, I, I have been talking about that. Well, uh, go ahead. Some, someone else in the garden mentioned that if we had a way to expand the area we were picking up to, we might be able to pick up more. So just a thought, you know. Yeah, no, yeah. I was only sure. thinking thought, narrowly yeah. about one particular pickup. But... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. Thank you for bringing it up. Okay, um, I'll send you a note. Yes, please do. Please do. Um, I do answer all those emails. Um, uh, and thank you so much for sending that thought. Um, let me get back to you on that because that's a bit specific to, to RPC. So for sure. Okay. Are there any other questions? Um, let's see. Annette. Let's see. Any other questions? I'm looking. Um, well, let's see. Is Brad on? I'll come back to Riverside Park. I'm looking. There's. Um, they were not able to get on the call, but they did, did send an email update, and I just need a couple of minutes to find it. So um, is Brad Taylor on for Friends of Morningside Park? I didn't see Brad. Okay. And I'm looking for the update. There was an update for, um, so we'll go ahead and just come back to me. Well, because we need to keep the agenda moving. Is Tapaji on? I think I saw her earlier. Yeah, I saw her earlier, but she doesn't seem to be on at this time. Okay. All right. Well, then I'll jump right in and keep things moving along. <laughs> so uh, just uh, a few things, a few updates. So the 112th, um, oh, she said she just said her audio is not working. Uh, so the 112th uh, concessionaire uh, construction is still moving along and expected to be hopefully up and in operation this summer. Uh, as mentioned before in this meeting, they're also redoing the public restrooms down at 112th. Uh, so it will be great to have those renovated uh, along with having a, a concessionaire uh, in Morningside Park. Um, and then the 113th handrail uh, pr uh, project, which we previously mentioned, uh, should be starting here uh, this uh, this April within the next uh, coming weeks. Uh, 
Um, so we'll look forward to having that work started and uh, hopefully it will progress along uh, quickly. Uh, the construction on the shelter and arms pool deck uh, is basically on schedule and almost complete. So uh, all the kids and families that swim there will have a brand new pool deck uh, and they've improved the, the filter plant operations for the wading pool there, as well as added uh, a splash uh, spray pad uh, area as part of the renovation. So it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna look like a brand new pool. Uh, we're excited. Um, and then, uh, the uh, Montefiora Community Forums that have been going on monthly with uh, the Montefiora Park Neighborhood Association um, and collaborative of many efforts. We're, we're meeting monthly. I encourage other people to, to uh, join those, those meetings. Uh, multiple divisions are, are there with uh, uh, NYPD, sanitation parks, um, uh, many agencies collaborating to try and uh, improve conditions in, in that area. Um, so those are all my updates before I jump into my presentation. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any questions thus far. If not, I'll go ahead and I'll read the announcement for Friends of St. Nicholas Park. Um, they hosted their annual Easter egg hunt in the park this past Saturday, March 30th. They scattered over a thousand eggs and welcomed 60 attendees, most, mostly families. In addition to the main event, attendees also enjoyed free face painting, springtime crafts, snacks, and games. The Easter Bunny made a special visit at the event's end. Their next event will be the, the annual Earth Day celebration and cleanup on Sunday, April 21st at noon. Um, they continue to hold monthly cleanups through the spring, throughout the spring and summer, and it generally occurs on the second Saturday of each month. So um, I've read those remarks into the record, mm -hmm. and I'm checking to see if Leslie Wright has joined the call yet. Hi, Heather. It's Leslie oh, here. I hope you can hear me. <laughs> great. Okay, thank you Leslie. for putting up with my lateness. <laughs> no, thank um, you. Uh, sure. Hi, everybody. Um, speaking of Easter and Easter egg hunts, Denny Farrell Riverbank State Park held a really successful, over 400 people strong Easter festival this past Saturday. Uh, the Easter Bunny seems to be making the rounds because <laughs> he or she or there they was at riverbank as well and uh all the families and kids anybody who wanted to got photos taken with the easter bunny on that beautifully dry and sunny saturday um uh, our park director sent over all the flyers about our various programs to youth uh, earlier this evening and i i hope that um uh, you all will have access to them soon. We have vibrant senior socials, arts and crafts for kids, uh, and um, open mic Harlem on the Hudson nights. Uh, regularly scheduled programs are going really, really strong. Too, too many to detail here. I think that the biggest news of the evening from Riverbank uh, is twofold. One, we have our I love our annual. I love my parks day for state parks coming up the first Saturday of May. It's May 4th this year. Registration is now open and you all are um, invited to please sign up individually in groups, however you wish, bring your friends, bring your family, bring your neighbors and come help out at the park. We have a bunch of projects starting in the morning and going through the afternoon. Uh, get this year's, I love my Park State t-shirt, different color than last year. The other big news is, and you all are hearing it here first, our renovation of the Aquatic Center locker rooms is wrapping up and the new locker rooms will open on, drum roll please, June 1st. <laughs> Yay! That's right, June 1st. Tell everybody, come on and come swimming. Um, we're going to keep some of the striped 
changing cabanas on the pool deck because everybody loves them so much and they're so stylish. Um, but our new locker rooms will be open um, and we'll make that announcement loud and proud at the next friends meeting, which is not this Saturday, but next Saturday, 1030, uh, second floor of the main building in rehearsal room B. Um, and, and that's it. Please do check the website for all the programming information and, and really hope to see you at the park. Happy to answer any questions if, if, if our co-chairs say that there's another minute available for that. Great. Any questions for Leslie? Any questions? Okay. I see that our representative from the National Park Service, I think I saw her on here. Callie, um, do you um, do you want to make any remarks this evening? If you're on. Yes, thank you. Um, I don't have too much to report. Um, we are getting going with some of our spring events. Um, the most notable event that I have to report is on April 27th at 11 a.m. We will be having the annual General Grant birthday uh, memorial service at General Grant National Memorial. And um, everyone's invited. We're going to be welcoming the um, color guard from West Point as well as their military band. And we are working to put together a keynote speaker to speak about the legacy of Ulysses S. Grant. Um, so once again, that's April 27th at 11 a.m. The ceremony will be about an hour, and then we'll have some kids' activities after the ceremony. So it should be a very nice day. Thank you so much, and thanks again for being here. Um, yes. My pleasure. Thank you. And Tapaji, I see you're on. Are, are you able to get your volume working yet? Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Okay, great. I'm on two different locations, just to be <laughs> sure. Um, so let's see, we have a few updates for historic Harlem parks, which uh, includes Jackie Robinson. Um, this weekend, Harlem Little League is kicking off their season, and they're marching from the Eagle Academy to the Jackie Robinson Band Show. And after their their march, there'll be a horse of course program, which is a partnership with our mounted pep unit and our urban parks ranger who will give a brief history on uh, horses in law enforcement. Uh, so that's uh, Jackie Robinson from 9.30 to 10.30 this Saturday. There will be another horse of course program at Morningside Park on May 4th from two to three, if you'd like to, I, I can actually send you a link to that. So I'll send you to the, to the first, to sign up for the Horse of Course program this weekend at Jackie Robinson in the chat right now. And I'll send you the morning side one as well. I'll also mention it again when it's closer to, to May. Uh, for April at Morningside Park, uh, the Urban Park Rangers are hosting a Kids Week. Uh, gather at the fire, uh, a fire, uh, sorry, campsite, a uh, campfire on April 22nd from 1 to 2, and that's at West 110th Street and Manhattan Avenue. And then to on the topic of Jackie Robinson Day, we're having the festival on April 14th this year. If anyone would like to sign up to volunteer, the deadline to do so is April 8th. Um, and volunteering, includes uh, a cleanup on 145th Street and wayfinding throughout the event from 12 to 4. And the, the volunteer cleanup uh, would be from 10 to 12 p.m. Uh, volunteers will receive food and there's two shifts, the 10 to 12 and then the, four, the 12 to 4. So if anyone is interested in signing up to volunteer, please do so. There will be performances and tabling activity at the band shell and baseball and pickleball clinics and in the north lawn from 153rd to 155th street there will be pet services and lastly i wanted to mention that new york city parks has issued a request for proposal 
for the sale of specialty items from mobile units. Uh, Parks is seeking co concessionaires for a five-year term per location. Uh, concessionaires must operate as a self-contained service located in the mobile units for sale of food and beverages, such as specialty sandwiches, salads, desserts. Um, so please, if you know any food trucks or anyone in who has a mobile unit and are interested, please let them know to submit their proposal. The deadline for proposals is April 16th at 3 p.m. I can send you the link uh, for the request for proposal. Thank you so much. Um, any questions for Tapaji? Harlem's historic parks. St. Nicholas Park, Morningside Park, and Jackie Robinson Park. And Marcus Garvey. And Marcus Garvey. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, very good. Um, let's see, again, everyone, if you haven't already done so, please sign your name and affiliation into the chat. Um, your email will be helpful too, so that you can be part of our mailing list and get updates about events um, going on in the community regarding parks and landmarks. So we're moving the agenda along. Okay, Matt. Um, let's see. Um, I think you're, if there aren't any other questions, we have Matt from, again, from the Administrative Park and Recreation Manager, Let's Green, Let's Green New York City. Matt, do you need um, to, sh you need to share your screen? Yeah, could you share? Could you uh, share my screen? I already enabled it. You're in a okay, great. So let me make you a co host. You can try again because you should. Great. All right, great. So let's. Uh... All right, so we shared on this uh, a little bit last year, uh, but we uh, wanted to update uh, everyone in the community board, especially since we're getting into our volunteer season. So uh, New York City Parks has started uh, Let's Green, uh, which is a, a way that we're looking to try and track and engage uh, volunteers and reach a record number by the end of 2024. Um, as you all know, uh, during COVID, our parks were, um, uh, you know, a, a place where people gathered and and uh, looked to use parks uh, to escape um, and, uh, you know, re-energize. Uh, so we uh, are looking uh, for people to, to continue uh, working in our parks. Uh, and, um, you know, we believe uh, that by people uh, being in our open spaces and volunteering, uh, they'll get uh, a more positive uh, feeling out of being in our parks uh, and uh, helping to improve uh, our parks and, and taking, you know, feeling like they are, or their park is a part of uh, their community. Um, so what we're we're looking to do is to improve tracking, to engage a record number of volunteers by the end of the 2024, uh, to better track our volunteers and their cumulative impact in our parks. And this is not just in Manhattan. This is a, across all five boroughs. Um, we're looking to expand equity to create. We've created a new website to better match groups and individuals together. Uh, so for example, like Friends of Morningside and St. Nicholas, which I'll go into later on, have a posting on our website uh, where then uh, volunteers, if you wanna volunteer Morningside, St. Nicholas, Riverside Park, uh, that can direct uh, volunteers directly to some of our partner groups. Um, and we're looking to enhance engagement to celebrate existing volunteers and attract new groups uh, who uh, people may not be aware of. 
so why volunteer with New York City Parks? Volunteering is a longstanding pillar of New York City Parks mission. You know, we work with uh, people in different groups throughout the year to help maintain, uh, clean our parks and, and be active and, and take uh, some ownership in our parks. Uh, it helps to, to boost mental uh, and physical health and morale um, volunteering with the group can fight loneliness and foster new connections with people in their community that maybe you've never met before. Uh, if you go and go and uh, join a volunteer project with one of our friends groups, maybe you'll meet someone that lived in your building uh, and make a connection with them that you uh, maybe wouldn't have spoken to otherwise. Uh, Parks offers, uh, and we offer hundreds of volunteer opportunities overall over the entire city with a diverse group uh, of different backgrounds uh, and projects uh, to beaches, playgrounds, gardens, trails, uh, planting trees, tree stewardship, natural areas. There's a, a lot of opportunities uh, which are all linked uh, on our new page on our website. Um, so uh, on the website, you can go and you can filter uh, by activities that people might be interested in and in looking to volunteer for. Um, uh, so if there's a, a dog run group or people are interested in a litter pickup or some type of community gardening or, or other community engagement, you can filter by, um, by that opportunity. Um, and then groups can also be added uh, to our group directory. So Friends of Morningside, uh, uh, Friends of St. Nicholas, the Riverside Park Conservancy uh, are all on this page, but I'm sure there's other groups uh, throughout uh, Manhattan that uh, and our, our community that may uh, not uh, be aware of this opportunity to get uh, their organization on uh, our parks page to promote uh, work that they're doing and to look to engage volunteership uh, for their for their um, the projects they're working on uh, and not and not only does this include uh, parks but this is also you know incorporates tree stewardship as well um, so you know we're not just looking at you know, uh, are, are what you would consider regular parkland, but um, there are groups who, who are steward our, our urban forest. Um, so get involved with Let's Green NYC. Uh, you can visit the park's website uh, to volunteer and match for opportunities of interest. Uh, we're encouraging volunteers to go to the Let's Green NYC group directory uh, and help it grow. Like I spoke before, if there's groups that you know that are doing great work in our community uh, to make sure that they're, they're aware of the opportunity. Um, and there's, I wanted to pull up the website here really quick because there's a few things that weren't on the presentation that our agency set that I wanted to highlight really quick. Uh, if I can move. So one great thing about the, the, um, uh, here's all the, the list of all the groups that you can search and filter. Um, so you can see uh, Friends of Morningside is there with a blog and you can click on their link and then that'll take uh, you to uh, contact information for Friends of Morningside and the same as uh, for Friends of St. Nicholas. Um, but for people that maybe want to volunteer on their own and they don't want to maybe necessarily be um, connected to a group, but they want to get credit for the work that they've done. Uh, on the page is also uh, a place where you can click on volunteer on your own. So maybe there's somebody that just goes and cleans, picks up garbage for an hour uh, a week. They can enter their information into our website so their their uh, volunteer hours get tracked. You know, maybe they pull, pull weeds in uh, the staircase treads, or uh, they take care of their local street trees uh, in front of their building. You can enter that in for your information here uh, to make sure that our agency knows of the great work you're doing. And then also the page connects you with, uh, you know, a lot of other parks uh, divisions uh, that you can get connected with to do volunteer work uh, through our stewardship, through Green Thumb, uh, shape up New York uh, partnerships for parks, um, and you can request uh, 
volunteer act there's a form uh, and a link on the parks website where you can actually request a project that will connect you with our partnerships for parks team to see uh, if there's a way that uh, we can, parks can accommodate you uh, with a volunteer request. Um, so that's all I have. Does anyone have any questions? Excellent, Matt. And uh, here's the uh, the the website. Uh, this you can get there from uh, our uh, uh, parks uh, website. But the direct link to go to that page is nyc.gov slash park slash volunteer. And that will take you directly to the website. And we can uh, I can share uh, that link as well uh, in the chat. Great. Thank you for doing that. Any questions for Matt? Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Um, and I will go ahead and let's see. And Annette, how are we doing with time? <laughs> okay, so we're ready for our next presentation. Where are we on the agenda? Grow New York City. Liz, are you on? I am. Um, Hi. Oh, great. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop sharing and give you um, sharing capabilities. Perfect. Let's okay, thanks. see if I can do that. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. And <laughs> um, it's great to hear about <clears throat> all these wonderful initiatives happening in the neighborhood. Um, yes, okay. thanks for re responding so promptly, Liz. It's good to see you here. Welcome. Of course. Yeah, it's great. Happy. I'm going to give, I'm going to go through this quickly because I know you all have a big agenda and I'll kind of talk about for only see a little bit, but I'll leave time for questions. Um, and I'll just introduce myself real quick. I'm Liz Crollo. I'm an assistant director for Grow NYC's food access and agriculture programs, specifically the green market program, which I'll talk about right now. Um, so Grow NYC's Food Access and Agriculture Program is kind of the umbrella for a number of food access initiatives um, with a two-part mission. So we help regional farmlands uh, remain viable by providing space in New York City to sell the foods that they grow, raise, catch, bake. Um, and then we provide food across New York City um, so that all residents have equitable access to that fresh food that's grown on regional farms. Um, and we operate markets uh, throughout the five boroughs. So right now we're in, uh, we're in entering spring obviously, but still in our winter schedule. So we have 26 markets that are opening, that are open right now uh, year round. This photo is from our market up at 175th. Um, and then in the summertime, so starting, actually starting in April now, we open a couple markets in May, a couple more. And by June, we're pretty full throttle with 46 markets operating um, primarily until Thanksgiving. So that's, that's generally the, the Northeast growing season. Um, we work with 230 small family farms that apply to the program each year. Um, and then come in and, you know, we set up markets based on, um, you know, who, who, what the farmers apply for, um, where they want to go. And I don't have to get all into the details on our application process. Happy to answer any questions about it, but it's so, it's so detailed. Um, but yeah, so we work with 200, over 200 producers throughout the Northeast. Um, and just a little bit of history. Our, far, our founders are Barry Benepe and Bob Lewis. Um, and in 1976 or around 75, they kind of looked around and what they were seeing was that a bunch of farms upstate and in the region were going out of business. They had a lot of development pressure. They didn't have anywhere to sell their food directly. Um, wholesale, they, they could, it was kind of get big or get out. They could get, um, they could sell wholesale. Uh, and many of them didn't want to. Their operations were too small um, and selling wholesale didn't make sense for them. So they said, well, how about if we can find some space for you in New York City 
And in 1976, I mean, it was, uh, that was not happening. There was not a lot of fresh food, especially coming in directly from farms. So they set up their first market at 59th Street and 2nd Avenue. And this is day one you're seeing in this image. So it was just um, an absolute madhouse and uh, grown ever since Union Square opened that later that year. Um, now Union Square obviously open, runs four days a week. We have 46 locations throughout the five boroughs. Um, we have, you know, now made it through uh, super storms and pandemics and all kinds of things. And um, clearly a New York City institution and um, hope to continue to grow in the, in the coming years. Uh, and like I mentioned, we work with 230 farms throughout the region. And so this is our map. Um, can't see all the farm names. It's also available on our website and we hang it as a big banner up at markets, but you can kind of see the vast majority of our producers are coming from New York state, but also um, the surrounding areas. It's basically, if you put a pin in Poughkeepsie and you drew a 200 mile radius, that's what we consider our region. Um, with our fishermen coming from Long Island and fishing the mid-Atlantic waters up into the Northeast um, and all the way out to the Finger Lakes and South Jersey. And then these are our, this is a map of our current locations right now. So our winter schedule. And um, so Green Market is one retail model that Grow NYC runs for food access, which is farmers coming in and setting up like a market that you're probably familiar with. and selling directly to the customers. And then we have another retail model called Farm Stand where we source all of that produce from our wholesale division, Grow NYC Wholesale. Um, and then we have our own Grow NYC staff who set up and sell produce directly out of tents. And they do that throughout New York City also. So we try, we, we do both models depending on the neighborhood or what the, um, what the need is or where um, there's a food access need, then we can typically, we have a little more flexibility with the farm stand model. And as you probably all know, we have the Columbia University Green Market that operates within CB9. Um, wonderful market, been there for many, many years and operates on both Thursdays and Sundays. I was just up there last week with uh, some folks from Wellness in the Schools, another great nonprofit and uh, doing a piece for BronxNet on shopping local. Uh, it was great to be there, the neighborhood's so beautiful. Um, and if, like I said, we operate markets throughout the five boroughs. So we serve the uh, diversity of New York City. And um, as, as part of kind of our two-part mission, you know, we help farmers remain viable. We also provide equitable access to fresh local food. But we have this kind of third piece to our mission that's like creating community spaces um, where neighbors see each other, engage, interact, learn, kids activities, cooking demonstrations, that kind of thing. Um, we, you know, we took a big hit from COVID. That was, it was difficult to continue to operate markets. We pulled back on our programming quite a bit. Uh, we pull, pulled back on growth quite a bit. Um, our operations took a hit. Uh, we, we continued to operate, but it was hard. And we have been trying to kind of climb out of that ever since and, and programs included and it's coming to gonna come back in a big way already has the last year, um, but going into this season also. So more, more programming at markets, more outreach, um, more partnerships, that kind of thing. So um, feels like we're kind of co coming out of it uh, this last year or so. Um, and of course, just some reasons to continue to shop a local farmer's market or farm stand, get to know the farmers who grow the food, uh, preserve area farmland, like this beautiful farm in Delaware County. Um, of course, you have access to the freshest, healthiest food. This is uh, clearly a photo from the fall and most flavorful because it's just been recently harvested. Um, get to know your neighbors and see each other, maybe participate in this fun painting activity they have going on. Um, and of course, support regional economy and keep farmers in business and keep farms viable. They protect the land and water surrounding New York City. So very, very important um, to the region. 
And then of course we provide access to New Yorkers. Uh, um, so anyone for customers who are shopping with nutrition benefits, we accept SNAP, EBT, Farmers Market Nutrition Program checks are issued in July for recipients of WIC and for older adults. Um, as of a few years ago, we started, we worked with Health First to be able to accept OTC Plus um, for Medicare recipients. And that has just, got, those sales have just skyrocketed. So previously, those members, those insurance members were able to spend their OTC Plus at like a Walgreens, um, but not on fresh, healthy food. And now they're able to come to the market swipe their card in exchange for green market bucks and then shop freely throughout the market. It's been an incredible program. I was doing transactions just this last weekend at one of our Brooklyn markets and this really had an impact on um, people's diets and health. So it's been wonderful. And then of course we have the health bucks program as part of our SNAP EBT sales. So customers shopping with SNAP or EBT um, or with SNAP Every for every two dollars they spend, they get an extra two dollars to spend on fruits and vegetables, so up to ten dollars a day. So you can double um, how much you're getting in in food from the farmers market with the health buck program. So I, there's been a lot of requests, specifically from this group about Montefiore Square. Um, so we can talk about that a little bit. We've had a number of requests from within the district. Um, and for us, there is a gap. We have the market at Columbia, and then we don't have another green market, at least until Fort Washington at 168th. Um, so we would very much like to operate a market um, somewhere in the district, another market. Uh, we had a market at Sugar Hill from 2015 to 2017. It just didn't do well. We could not really get it off the ground. At one point, there was a free food distribution happening across the street that can sometimes have a, an impact on um, customers like showing up at our site expecting free food. And so that was difficult. Um, but sometimes we just struggle to get a market going and the farmers don't have um, the bandwidth or the ability financially to, to stick out a location. Um, so that it, ultimately we had to close that site. But I do think there's um, clearly like a, a lot of great locations in the neighborhood. Um, and we very much would like to go back as soon as we can kind of figure out um, what that looks like for green market in our limited capacity. We've been understaffed for a few years, um, but trying to figure out strategically where's, where is the best location. Um, so what makes a great green market location, as you can imagine, it would be easily visible and accessible. It's well known, like a, a lot of foot traffic through um, the area, medium to high density, that's pretty much all of New York City, so I've got that covered. Um, but yeah, a lot, a lot of existing foot traffic, we like to be near subway stations, we like to be on people's routes. Um, we like to have a, 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 not so much a local sponsor financially, but a partner in the area who's going to help us do outreach and, and get the word out um, and help with promotional assistance. And then, you know, sanitary facilities, some things, sometimes things people don't really think about when wanting a market in their neighborhood is like we need a place to park trucks and we need uh, a place for the our staff and farmers to use the restroom throughout the day so those are those are some of the kind of behind the scenes things that we have to think about when opening a new location um, so I want to talk about Montefiore Square for a minute I just recently saw this space um, is beautiful, obviously, such a such a nice location. There is maybe someone on this call could answer this question. Um, you know, there's this construction happening at the subway entrance. I know that the inner part of the park is open and really beautiful, but typically our farmers have to have their trucks behind their stands. We really we 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 prefer or kind of require the to either be street side or inside a plaza. Um, like at Brooklyn Borough Hall or Grand Army Plaza or even Union Square where the, we have the whole plaza space and the farmers have the trucks behind their stands. So um, our preference is always going to be to be street side. So this construction, I don't know the timeline on it. And I think our government liaison was looking into that um, just in, you know, in talks of like where, where could we potentially even open a market 
um, when we looked at the space, uh, we needed to get a timeline on that first. Um, just to get every, what everybody's appetite and get you ready for summer, I threw that photo in. And this is my contact information. Um, I'm happy to stop talking now and answer questions if anyone has any. Any questions? And we also have Michael Palma on um, the call. Michael, do you want to make any comments about this location? Are you on another one of the sponsors for this location? I think Adam wasn't able to make it. Liz, I'll join in on the, um, uh, I'm the park manager for Montefiore. As far as I know, we've heard from the MTA that the work is expected to take up to two years. Okay. Um, so it's definitely, and it just started within the last, uh, I don't know, maybe two or three months. So they're, they still have a, a ways to go before okay, uh, construction is complete. Yeah, it's it's good to know. I mean, obviously, when we saw it, we thought that looks like a long term thing. It looks like an elevator or something going in. Um, yeah. It, uh, yeah. So so they are installing. They're uh, removing um, a staircase, installing an elevator, and then redoing the other staircase to make that ADA accessible. So it's a multi phase. Um, construction process okay, uh, with great. them. As someone who is newly traveling the city with a stroller, I'm very appreciative <laughs> of it. So, sounds good. Thank you for uh, sharing that, Matt. And, and Michael, yes, I see no you're problem. on. If, if, if I hear that that timeline is going to be sooner than than that, I'll, I'll for sure give you guys updates uh, as I as I hear that information. Great, thank you. And then Matt put something in the chat. We're here to help. <laughs> okay, well, or Michael, I mean, sorry. Um, well, if there's anything. I, yeah. I have one question for vendors who are not necessarily existing in your program now. When you do set up these markets, is there room for um, independent vendors or they have to become a part of the group that exists for you now? Typically when we set up a market and we have a permitted space, we're only able to have approved green market vendors selling within that space. We coexist with non-green market vendor just because we're so strict on who can sell within a green market location. It's basically farmers selling farm-based products and mm -hmm. realize you know there's a lot more vendors out there selling all kinds of products. We, we do coexist um, at, next to markets with non-green market vendors in a lot of places. Um, and, and so we, we, we know how to kind of navigate that. But yeah, typically if we're permitted space and we have, um, we're responsible and have any liability over you know, that square footage, we typically just have green market producers, our info tent, and then community guests that we bring in that we also require a certificate of insurance of to come in. So we're very, very liability averse in that way. But yeah, but of course we do coexist next to um, non-green market vendors in a lot of locations and um, harmoniously as well. Okay. Hi, hi, every, hi, everybody. Can, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Oh my God! I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm, <laughs> my I've been ha I've been having problems with my uh, headset. Well, you know what? It's gotten me through COVID. I think it's time to retire it and get a new one. I'm really <laughs> sorry, guys. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that Montefiore Park Neighborhood Association is, uh, as I said in the chat, uh, we're here to help. And as far as the checklist of things that you require, you know what? Montefiore Park has them all. You know. Um, uh, you have a willing partner uh, that helps well, would help publicize it within the area here. Uh, and I, I live right across the street from the park. As a matter of fact, I'm looking at it right now through my window. And depending on how many tables or, or, or uh, vendors you have, I, and Matt has to um, maybe uh, fill this 
in for me, but I, I see room for trucks and tables in the park or in the south side of the park going from the pharmacy all the way up to where the, the, the green section lives or just past the kiosk. Mm -hmm. So is that possible, Matt? Can they come in there with their trucks? And no, our agency will not allow uh, the vehicles in the park. Okay. Oh, all right. Is that just a Montefiore thing, or is that it no? It's else? it's every park um, uh, across. Uh, it's agent. That's the agency policy. Oh, okay. Well, uh, there then there is space along Broadway before the construction, starting from the the corner all the way up to the bus stop, and so. Um, maybe there's an opportunity for them to, to park there, depending on how many tables um, would be allowed or, or can fit. But uh, is it in the space of the, the farmers would need to park, so would they be in the bus stop? No, no, just okay. south of the bus stop. There, there's, uh, there's space south of the bus stop. Okay, then, then I think it's just, um, it, it would be nice to have somebody who um, kind of brokered the relationship with the vendor selling down there. And, you know, they have like a wide array of produce and we just, we want to, we always go in wanting to be a good neighbor. Um, I know there's a grocery store across the street too, but those are things we think about where we want, you know, if we're, we want to be welcomed in and know and want the, um, nearby stores especially ones selling similar products to feel like um happy that the market's there and it's going to help increase their business sure. and drive the traffic to the area which it typically does in practice yeah. but it can be a fear of businesses sometimes yeah, um, I, I, so. I understand that i don't think you you compete directly compete with each other because the 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 products you sell are, are fairly different uh but um uh, yeah, we should we should explore it and discuss that. I, d I don't know. I know that uh, CB9 and this committee uh, just recently passed a re resolution in favor of that. Uh, so, um, you know, we're happy to write a letter of support in favor of that as well as, as a community based organization. Uh, there are two other or three other community based organizations in the immediate area that can also write a letter of support. So whatever the next step is, uh, maybe we can take it up from there. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And like I mentioned, we've had, we've really struggled to come back post COVID with our operations and getting fully staffed and really trying to figure out what our growth w would look like and where we would open new locations. So we're out visiting all these sites. Um, uh, but it, it, it clearly is a beautiful site and tons of great foot traffic and everything. Um, sure. Liz, can you put your information? I know you put it on the screen, but it's very hard to, Sure. Uh, see it now in the chat and, and then we can follow uh, you know follow up you know uh, later on this week or, or whenever it makes sense uh, don't exactly. it okay. is what will probably be wise for us since parking is in a very important part of this setup is to speak with our uniform services committee because it may be possible that they can speak with uh, the police department to see if there's a way to reserve some parking for that short period of time. I don't know if that's Wonderful. possible, but we may need to get them involved just as a suggestion. Wonderful. Great. Yeah, Wonderful. we typically do try to secure parking and go through DOT for that. So it's, sure. that, that's great, yeah. Um, okay, well, thanks. I know I've taken up a lot of time in the meeting. I really appreciate you having us and um, it was great to see everybody and don't hesitate to put my email in the chat. So don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you, Liz. We'll be in touch. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. And then we're here for our last presentation. We have Coda Alliance. I'm looking for, okay, I'm going to, um, is it Michael or Matson? Do you require, um, let's see, I, I just had your name up here. Heather, it's Yana. Can I say a couple of words before I turn it over to Michael? Yes, I'm still going to give him. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, Thank hi. Because so I much. see so many. Thank you so much for having us. We were, of course, here presenting uh, in January, um, and uh, but I see so many more names here now. So um, <laughs> yeah, so nice to see you all. 
Uh, so we are uh, a nonprofit for gender equality and women's empowerment. We're at 43 St. Nicholas Place at 152nd Street. Um, and uh, we're looking to do some renovations in the building, which is from 1885, you know, with the view to preserving, of course, its historical character or actually improving, improving, uh, you know, some aspects of it. Um, and uh, briefly what we do there, the reason we want to do this renovation, uh, apart from the fact that the building needs it, uh, is that it would um, enhance our capacity to serve the community with our programs. Uh, we we particularly focus on the two pillars of women's empowerment, which is economic empowerment and health and wellness. Um, so last year, uh, we've been there two years now, and last year we focused a, a lot on uh, like digital literacy, financial literacy, um, uh, women entrepreneurship, uh, and now we're sort of pivoting uh, towards health and wellness or, or sort of adding that element um, in, in collaboration with other community organizations such as Harlem Wellness Center. Um, and uh, uh, we also use the uh, space for community activities such as uh, the arts. We've had uh, two arts exhibits there for women artists of Harlem. Um, and uh, looking into this spring to start some, uh, what we call healing arts programming. And our purpose for renovating is number one, um, safety issues. So um, because we have, you know, sometimes larger gatherings, uh, we need a second uh, exit for, you know, fire exit, a second uh, egress from the building. Um, and also until we have that, we can't really have children in the building, which we would like to have a nursery so that women, you know, could be could come to the uh, programs that we offer and and um, you know have someone watch the kids while they're, you know, utilizing the program. <clears throat> and also, pregnant women is something that we um, are looking to include services for pregnant women. I'm an OBGYN myself, retired, um, and uh, you know, there's a lot of health issues surrounding pregnancy, particularly in Black women. So um, we're sort of moving in, into that direction. Um, so that second exit to the roof, which is the only possibility, uh, you know, is um, what we're looking to do. In addition to making it ADA compliant and also increasing uh, energy efficiency. Um, so I'd like to turn it over to uh, Michael Matson to just explain some of the details. And we had some questions after last the last meeting. Um, so we've tried to address those. Um, and then, of course, you know, if you weren't there last time, we can answer any questions or show you more details. So, Michael, you want to take it over from here? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Yana, and thank you, Heather. Um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen. Screen two. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, so the two main scope items that we're, we're talking about right now are the um, the entry renovation, which is to make the building accessible, and then the bulkhead, which we can see up here behind these, these roofs um, to, to provide that second means of egress to the roof for the building, um, um, to make it co-compliant and also safe for people to occupy. Um, and so I'm going to jump forward. Here we're looking at the entry. I'm going to go ahead and breeze past this because most of the discussion is about the bulkhead. Um, here we see uh, a before and a proposed view of the building as it is now and the building with the proposed bulkhead. It's sitting right here, visible from um, the corner of 152nd Street, West 152nd Street, uh, and it sits right above the existing building stair. So um, these are some of the questions that, that arose after our initial presentation um, on February 7th. Um, those were mostly, um, th those questions were pertaining to the size of the the bulkhead and its location on the building. Um, could it be, you know, uh, moved further towards the north so it's not visible? Um, we have questions about the materiality of the, the, the bulkhead as well. And also um, with the massing of the bulkhead, uh, is it impacting the neighbor's views or is it impacting um, neighboring buildings in other ways that we haven't examined? So uh, just to get into the first kind of questions about the actual size of the bulkhead, um, and its location. Uh, we do have a, a minimum footprint here for a, a typical um, like building stair up to the roof. Uh, this is with our max uh, rise and run that we could accomplish with this, um, with our occupancy and uh, minimum landing sizes of three feet, three feet here as well. Will uh, you please use the cursor to point out to the group um, 
what you may be referring to in, and I, I hope that you've also included in your presentation the um, actual photos from the roof. Uh, I do have a couple of photos from the roof um, yes. that we can uh, just take a look at uh, further on, uh, or photos of the rooftop. Um, oopsies, sorry about that. Uh -huh. So this is our, our minimum footprint, and we looked at moving it to the north. Um, you know, uh, moving it off of our existing stair hall, which is in, in the current proposed location, starts to produce a lot of issues where we have a lot of venting at this side. So we're needing to do pretty extensive reconfigurations for our boiler exhaust and our, um, our vent stacks for the existing bathrooms, as well as having to remove and relocate the bathroom at the top floor down here to accommodate that stair in a place where it's not visible from the street. Um, so that, uh, kind of summarizes the challenges that we would face in, in kind of moving that to the north uh, as had been proposed in the last meeting. Um, I also want to note that at the um, at the Landmarks Preservation Commission, our staff preservationist who we have been working with who's assigned to our case and his supervisor are pretty um, sort of sympathetic to our need to maintain the stair in this location. Uh, they're sort of viewing it as um, historically consistent to extend that stair up to the roof. Um, we have also consulted with an expediter uh, and done our own code review, which um, uh, we have, I believe, shared with you. I'm not sure it's in this presentation, but I can pull it up if you would like to take a look at it. Uh, and I think we cited section 101.1.2, which um, suggests that one stairway should extend up through the roof. And, and so our review and our expediter's review um, conclude that we could start to encounter issues um, at the building department, if we're if we're kind of moving the stair up to the roof off of uh, the existing building stair, so moving it off of this location. So several um, challenges there. Here are some of the code citations for the venting um, venting uh, requirements that we were looking at, um, having to move different building systems. I'm going to go ahead and breeze past those. So moving on to cladding, we had questions about the materiality. Uh, here, this is our, our specific proposed cladding. We hadn't included it previously. We are trying, it's a, it's a standing seam roof and we're trying to color match the uh, existing slate roof very closely so that they read very um, consistently with one another. Um, this is of course pending receipt of actual material samples and um, uh, confirmation or approval from the LPC. Uh, and here we have some photos on the right showing what that material looks like. So it's not you know, totally um, out of place against more historic materials like brick and, and stone. Um, just trying to tie, you know, the roofs together into one kind of cohesive language over here. And then we also had some questions about how we may be impacting neighbors' views or neighboring buildings in ways that we weren't looking at. So um, we have we have tried to mock up here through these images uh, what the view of this um, uh, uh, bulkhead will look like through our neighbors' windows. Um, this is our fourth uh, unit three B. I think it's the fourth floor of, of four hundred one West One Fifty Second Street. Uh, so right alongside that bulkhead, we're seeing it's um, the existing view is in this area is largely of the existing rooftop of, of Coda Alliance. So we're not um, really obstructing the view in, in any great capacity. Uh, and then one floor up, this is the fifth floor, unit uh, 4B. Um, we're almost clear of that bulkhead and, and we're um, not obstructing that view. And, and so this is uh, unit 4B. We're looking toward um, the north over the existing roofs. And that bulkhead is, is really kind of occurring in the visual field over top of the existing, you know, uh, back of house roof stuff. So um, not really, you know, obstructing a view down St. Nicholas Avenue. Uh, St. Nicholas Place, excuse me. Uh, so, so these are the photos that I, this is the photo that I do have in the presentation of um, the bulkhead. Uh, I could dig around for some additional photos if you'd like to see those. Um, yeah, could you please pr provide the photos that were emailed to us? We we did not receive the photo photos that you're showing right now. Okay. Um, so if you could please the I believe we received two photos. Uh, yeah, I can go ahead and pull those up. Um, okay. I am just navigating to them now. Sorry for the delay. No worries. 
Does anyone have any questions while he's pulling that information up? Yes. Is this a pre-existing organization? And um, what uh, do you have uh, proof that this is a pre-existing organization that has been, that has been uh, functioning? Could you speak up, please? Uh, I hope you can hear me. I have a cold. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, I hope I'm asking, is this a uh, CODA? Is it a pre-existing organization? And and how long and, and how successful have you been for the last, say, one year? That's what she said. Um, Heather, I can answer that question if you sure. like in the meantime. Oh, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so um, the CODA uh, was founded in 2015. So we've been around since then. Uh, we started with a little bit more of a global focus and we were... Um, uh, we were um, situated at a place called the Center for Social Innovation, which was located in Chelsea um, in a co-working space, uh, along with other similar organizations. But they closed, they went under during the pandemic. But we had um, already then decided, we had, were sort of thinking very hard about where, in which neighborhood in New York City we wanted to locate us, because even though we had kind of a, we, we still do also have partially a global agenda, um, we mm -hmm. kind of realized that, you know, mm -hmm. all activity kind of starts at the grassroots level and, and we wanted to be in a community. Mm -hmm. um, and so finally we landed on, on Northern Manhattan and started looking uh, for a building. And so in, in January of 22, we bought this building. Um, and uh, it's uh, because of that, we've been able to expand our uh you know, because of having an actual physical space, we've been able to expand our activities. So to include uh, more uh, local efforts, um, but we still also serve as a hub for, uh, you know, global women's organizations. So we occasionally have, you know, visiting global women's organizations in the building. Um, yeah, maybe and, I should have specified my question a little bit. At yeah. that location where you are on 152nd Street, how successful have you been there within the last year? Well, we have, we've only been there for two years. So the first year we were sort of busy uh, establishing connections to the community and uh, kind of making the rounds of other community organizations because we're not there to compete with existing organizations. We'd rather, uh, you know, we see ourselves as more of an umbrella organization. So uh, we offer the, the uh, space to other community organizations for use. And this is what's now been sort of picking up, especially in the last year. Um, so, for instance, we're uh, we've, all this this spring we've had uh, uh, ongoing, uh, you know, free yoga classes for women uh, in collaboration with Harlem Wellness Center, um, and this is kind of the model that we're looking at is to do collaborative events with um, and programs with other organizations. Thank you so much. I see a hand raised from Alyssa. Go ahead, Alyssa, with your question. Thank you so much. If you can hear me, I'm looking at the photo. Really speak. Could you speak up a little? You're a little muffled. Okay. Can you hear me now? So I'm yes. looking at the photo. I understood it at last time that you're in front of something fence on the rooftop. Um. No. You're. You're. You have to speak into the the mic or or increase your volume. Okay. We can't hear you. Can you hear me? Wait. Can you hear me better? Is this better? No. No. Okay, I'll write my question in the chat. There, now we can hear you. <laughs> um, so my question is, in the last last month's presentation, you said that you wanted to hold some events on the rooftop. But my concern is, I don't think there's any safety guardrails. Like, what if someone falls over on the edge? So I'm just wondering about that. Well, I think, uh, Michael, you can speak to that, but there's going to be a railing. I mean, that's required by law, you know, and uh, we're not really looking to have events there. It's rather small space. What we've, you know, sort of thinking about what we could use it for, uh, one thought which would sort of uh, really uh, appeal to the fact that we have, um, we're focused on health and wellness is maybe we could grow something there, you know, maybe we could have some, uh, um, some of those vertical farm things, you know, on the roof, that might be a possibility. Um, uh, but um, no, we're obviously not, nobody's going to fall off the roof, no way. Yeah, and if I, I am still, I think sharing my screen, you should be able to see some railing details which we have added to the presentation since our last um, uh, our last uh, discussion. So this is occurring um, 
the, the, the proposed bulkhead itself is preventing access to um, this portion of the uh, parapet, which would otherwise be accessible. And then we have at the back of the building, um, this proposed railing detail, it's sitting inside of the parapet and extending up um, three and a half feet from the roof deck, um, the finished deck, I should say, uh, to prevent access. Uh, our, our proposed design has vertical bars that would prevent people from um, you know, using them as climbing runs, uh, kind of an additional safe, safety measure to keep, um, keep people safe and away from the edge. Well, since this is a very small building and you're not talking about doing uh, Pilates or anything up on the rooftop, or you're talking about a garden now, that's different. So even though the real here, it's a very small unit, a very in, comparatively in the neighborhood, it's a very small unit. I would, uh, I, I, I hope and wish you success in your endeavor to make it what you propose it to be in comparison to your global view. But as of now, we have not seen, um, in the neighborhood, we haven't seen that. Um, Liz, go ahead with your question. Um, thanks, Heather. Um, can we go back to the current and proposed uh, roof plan detail, please? Uh, I do have a... And my my question, you said something about moving the stair to the north, but is there is there really no other location on the roof that is more hidden than the current location that's selected? Is there really nowhere else to put the stair? So here's our proposed roof plan. Um, and to address that question, I should go back to our uh, I suppose, fourth floor plan. Um, the issue we're encountering is that if we, um, the, the best strategy is to move it as far to the inside of the block as possible. Uh, and so this was our, our best um, bet for doing that and preserving space in the building. If we are you know, locating it um, further north in the, in the plan uh, or towards the back of the building over here, we're having to switch back. The stair is not long enough to uh, reach the roof uh, in a straight run up to the back. So we're having to switch it back and it terminates up here. Um, and so in addition to, uh, you know, removing usable space from the room below, it's still having a visible appearance here. Uh, it's it's shifted further, the, the mass of the bulkhead has shifted further towards 401 bus 152nd Street, but it's still very largely visible um, uh, from the south at that south elevation. Can I also ask a question, Michael? Isn't it also true that if we move the staircase away from the current opening, which has the skylight, that we'd have to cut through some beams and that can become a real can of worms because that might interfere with structural stability, et cetera? No. Yeah, uh, keeping the footprint from the stair below uh, potentially maintains the structure it's already prescribed for the building. As if we as we start to relocate, we're having to create duplicate openings. And as Michael mentioned, there seems to be no way without to uh, migrate the existing opening to the roof without violating the interpretation that it the only existing staircase, according to code, must go to the roof. And if we migrate the location, it, it's not going to be accepted as a common contiguous staircase by the building code and from the interpretation of our expediter. And, and as Michael reiterated earlier, we are have to clear also all these ventilation outlets as well. Does the stair have to be straight? Can it be a circular stair? Uh, I don't believe that a circular stair would comply uh, with egress requirements. I think that would be a straight run stair with uh, our minimum width of three feet 
or straight run or switchback or some other kind of. Um, mm. I'm not sure it would really actually make it smaller because when you do a circular stair, you have minimum tread sizes. So you'd end up with a large mm -hmm. cylinder, possibly about the same as that square shape. And um, and then it would probably be uh, as a round object, maybe a little foreign to the vocabulary of the building, which has these peaks and gables that we're trying to pick up the angles from. Heather, after Liz, Michael De Palma has a question as well. Go ahead, Liz. Um, can the stair be moved um, as we are viewing this plan to the right? Um, next to 45 St. Nicholas? Can it be moved in? Uh, so so that was, um, Scott, you may, you may want yeah, to- Yeah, that's this. this analysis that, that we talked about earlier. In fact, we show, in this case, we show, someone had asked earlier to, to move it completely to the north, uh, but even if we migrated it to the center, it's the same issue that we have a, a stair that's already set up so it can continue. And as if we migrated even to the middle, we're going to uh, maybe you show with the mouse, uh, all along that north edge are uh, ventilation outlets, uh, bathrooms, exhaust, more importantly, boiler. And as we get closer, we're, we have to relocate all those areas. It also makes the roof a um, little less usable. So, and again, it's not a continuous e extension of the stairway in the eyes of what the Department of Buildings uh, would interpret. Okay, yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. I think from my perspective, um, and I, I do historic preservation, um, I want to avoid being able to see this bulkhead at all costs. If there is another solution, I want to see it. And from what I'm hearing from this presentation is that um, there is no other solution outside of the design that is currently in place, which is that the, the stair is where it is. And if you want to have roof access, this is really the only place to put the stair. So personally, I feel like that's resolved for me, so thank you. Thank you. If I may add quickly, uh, the lady who lives in uh, 401 152nd Street uh, in apartment 4B actually let us in. I wasn't there myself, but our super and uh, our intern went in and took that photo that you saw you know, from the window. But the lady was very supportive of what we do, and she said it, it, she barely sees that. Oh, actually, this is, I think, from, no, this is from her apartment, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, uh, and also we had we had two open houses uh, where I invited you know neighbors in, um, you know putting posters in the uh, um, in their you know hallways and stuff. And um, actually, this lady came, and then another lady came from the other side, uh, from like forty five uh, I think or forty seven, Saint Nicholas Place, um, and she was also very supportive of uh, what we're trying to do. Uh, and honestly, if you walk down the street, what catches your eye is not something up on the roof, but that unfortunate graffiti, which is on our neighboring building, which belongs to 401 152nd. And since I now have a connection finally to someone in that building, um, we're trying to see if we can get permission from the co-op to do uh, like a mural there instead, like a pretty mural, uh, maybe as a youth summer project or something. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Michael. <clears throat> yes. Uh, good evening, everybody. Again, uh, I just wanted to say, and and I think Jana forgot that um, this past uh, winter, uh, uh, in the fall, past fall, uh, uh, the Coda Alliance had two great art ex exhibits featuring over twenty. West Harlem artists at the space, yes. and it was it was wildly successful. Thank and you. So, <laughs> and and I hope it's something they they, they will bring back again. Uh, so this is to answer the question of someone who has said what were there some of their successes, and <clears throat> as 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 the executive director of the West Harlem Arts Alliance, we work very closely with Coda Alliance to 
to uh, provide the recognition for these West Harlem artists where they would not have gotten it anywhere else here in the community. So um, we're, 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 we're happy to have had that success with COTA uh, in the fall. Uh, um, and we're looking forward to having it again, uh, either in the spring or during the summer or during the fall again. Thank you, Michael. Yes, I, I sort of yeah quickly glossed over that actually, but that was a major uh, thing. Thanks to your support and thanks also to the support of West Harlem, um, West Harlem uh, Development Corporation. Um, and we've also had support from Harlem Community Development Corporation. Um, and in fact, um, I have uh, already two letters of recommendation because we're applying for a renovation grant, mm -hmm. um, which is coming up now, a Congressional uh, Appropriations Grant. Um, so it's really nice to have that support from uh, these community organizations. Can you email us the updated um, drawings and um, pictures? Yes. Yeah, definitely. And I actually just emailed you, Heather, like uh, 15 minutes before the uh, uh, event started. I realized I should send you. So this whole presentation is in your email. Okay. All right. All right. I didn't. I didn't get a chance to look at it, and I'm just looking for the email with the photos in it because I still don't see the original photographs that you sent me from before. I think I'm sharing. Would that have been these um, sort of expansive views, or are you thinking of different photos? Um. I may have the wrong ones. Sorry about that. I'm not sure we have many more. I mean, I actually went up on the roof and took a few pictures, but they were kind of bad, so I didn't send them. Yeah. Uh, Michael, can you put up the one with the people and the view from the uh, bird's eye view that you had up a second ago? Oh, the bird's eye view. Yeah, that's on Google Maps, actually. Indeed. That yeah. over here. here we go. Yes, that one. Thank you. Heather, is that what you're looking for? No, no I, I haven't seen these photos before. I, I didn't see these before. I, I, go ahead, Annette, with your question. I don't have a question. I just want to say to Jana and her team, I thank you. You guys have made every attempt to be present and responsive to all of our inquiries. But I, I would encourage you, Jana, I know that your intentions, you have plans, you, you want to connect with the community. There is an elephant in the room and some skepticism about the, um, the, that community engagement that there needs to be more. And so I would encourage you to really, really, I know you're working at it. You're having open houses, every opportunity that you can get, but to get over this part, community is the key. It's the community board and all of us, please just continue to do as much as you can. Cause that's just that skepticism and all honesty is going to be there. Is there enough? Who are you working with and why some of your immediate neighbors just don't know who you are. So that just means there's more work for you to do with the community because we do need organizations such as yours. Thank you, Annette, very much. Yes, we, we realize that. And there's a certain, I think, just uh, some things just take time. I think because just in the last few months, we actually now have people coming to us asking if they can come in and do stuff in our building. Um, and uh, actually, if you go to our website and look at past events, um, there's, there's, you can see like what we have done there before. And uh, if you haven't seen so much about it, it's perhaps because you know the space is rather small. So it's difficult to have large events there, uh, but we do have small groups. We do want to keep it as a kind of a safe space for women. We work with a lot of people with trauma. Um, for instance, we have a, a now since last September, we're partnering um, with, they used to be called Reciprocity Foundation, but that organization folded. So we took them under our, our umbrella. 
And they Thank do you it. so much. The, the services yes. are, are very important yeah. and very much needed in the community. But I just I, I just want to get additional clarification about this space. Is this currently where the bulkhead is coming? Currently where the stairs or the access stairs currently come up onto the roof? Yeah. Right here. Yes. So were you able to get inside the, the apartment that sits right here? Yes, that was 4B. And uh, so she has one window which looks over the courtyard. So, so what was asked in, in our previous meeting, um, the person, this is not on the line right now. They were asking for a mock-up to be made of this area right here so that we could visually see how high the new bulkhead would be. So, and I think the question is, was whether or not the opening of the stairs or the bulkhead could actually come up in this area here where there are no windows and no um, potential to block a future residence view. Because right here, looking out of this, which is probably a living room window, mm -hmm. and if there is a bulkhead right here, um, then the view would be masked. So it's difficult for us to view where the bulkhead is actually coming up without actually seeing it on a photograph such as this. And this is what we were asking. Right. The lady says that because the window face is north. Well, I'm not concerned about that lady right here. That uh, lady may be gone next month. So right. for the yeah, person I mean, that might that move in that. in the future, I, we just we just want to know visually what from so that we can see in you know real space, real time, how oh, the God. stairs would come up onto this space and what the where the bulkhead would be. Is it here? Is this the area that will be blocked? Michael, can you answer that question? Yeah, uh, yeah that is the area where the bulkhead will, will be, where you're gesturing with your mouse. Okay. Michael, don't you have that image in your re responses? And and you're saying that it can't be, this can't be extended or moved forward so that um, this area here isn't heightened, but it, it would come up onto the roof in this area where no one's window view would be blocked because I don't see how whoever would be in this room that they would not be looking directly into a, a bulkhead in this area here. That's the issue. If it can, and right now you have, this is where the stairs are coming up. Why can't the stairs just come up into this this area where you currently have the access point of where the ladder would come up right now? Yes, so we so, explained that earlier that it becomes. But we visually it wasn't. We didn't. I couldn't see it visually. So if you could help us, you know, understand, I can stop sharing and you can go back to a picture that looks like this where we can actually see what this area is going to look like on the roof. Yeah. Okay. I'll stop sharing and allow you to, to put your photo back up yeah. and show us. Yeah. So I will go ahead and share my screen. Uh, and I think this, this, um, Screen two. I think this package of photos is is what was shared with you most recently. So uh, this is not relevant to us right now. Um, I, I believe these are the photos that were shared with you from Yana, uh, showing the view toward the bulkhead. So we are seeing that the bulkhead sits just um, uh, is sitting just above the current hatch right now. <laughs> right. So you're using all the open space. You're not masking it at all by mm -hmm. the, the the building where there are no windows or no um, where it wouldn't block a potential mm -hmm. residence view. It, yeah, but, but that wall doesn't align with the existing stair zone that is intended to be continuous in the way the the building code requires. And again, uh, it's- And you can't change the rise and the run of the stairs or you can't add a platform to these are, get you to this point? These are as steep as possible. Um, and, and again- the, and, and then you're showing all the ventilation is over on the opposite side. So I understand why you can't move the stairs to the opposite side of the roof. But even if we're just staying right within the area of where the stairs currently are, 
I, I, I'm I'm not satisfied that you're you're not you you've explained where the ventilation is. Which my understanding, it's on the opposite side of where the stairs are right now. Yeah, they're mostly on the north side. Right. So, but it, you're you're not explaining why you can't extend the area forward so that um, it's not such a high visibility in that opening, which will block a future residence view. Yeah. So, I will say, um, and I'm I'm not sure what the best way to show this right now is, but we do. Uh, so this is the hatch that comes up from the, the top landing of the stair right now. Um, and so the wall... Of and that's out of view. So, you know, I'm just... Yeah, so I will go back to this photo. Um, are you still seeing my screen? These yes. are the sort of fish Thank I you. use. Um, so the wall of the stair hall right now is situated right here. Um, and that would be out of the view of the person in the future whose window will be blocked. Yes, and um, so the top stair of the building right now is actually, um, well, I'll start with the lower three stairs. The lower three stairs are these uh, switchback U-shaped stairs, which have a tighter- Michael, just show this in plan, go to the original plans. No, yeah, okay. This isn't helpful. So I will go to those. Uh, gonna... <clears throat> I, I'm finding them in the presentation now. Apologies. All right. Just entry. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> I'm sorry. My um memory is uh. Yeah, but I slow think, machine. Yeah, slow machine, but here they are. So um, the existing stair at the top level is actually less compact than the stairs on the lower levels. And so what we are doing in the proposal is, um, yes, we're, we're lining up the, the stair hall on the upper floor with these walls on the, the, the grander stair below. And we're converting the straight run stair into a spiral stair to match the historical wow. U-shaped stair, which pulls this wall that we are looking <laughs> at. You said a spiral stair, which is oh. like a circular stair. Yeah, I'm, so I'm sorry, that was imprecise language on my part. It's oh, a yes. <laughs> U-shaped stair with two landings. Okay. Um, so that would be like this stair here at the second floor uh, and this stair here at the third floor. At the fourth floor, we have a straight run stair which extends further towards the back of the building. And what we're proposing is to shorten up the stair hall here and develop this um, U-shaped stair at the top floor, which makes it consistent with the historical stairs below. Uh, and then uh, extending that, that uh, shortened profile um, up to the roof. So we're, we're kind of pulling this, this wall further uh, in front of the hatch. Which is this wall? Can you point that out? Sorry. Okay. Yes, I, I think my mouse is... There it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're taking this wall and we're uh, bringing it towards the front of the building this way uh, to line it up with the walls of the stair below. Right, but I guess way. that's not... Th that's, you could always extend that further. You just don't want to take space away from that rear bedroom, I think is what the issue is. That is you could extend it forward. And then it's also, it's migrating the core stair shaft, possibly too far to the west. Yes, there, and, we would and, and we'd have to cut, space. We'd have hmm? to cut all this. We'd have to cut an opening in the rear bedroom and um, oh, add no. structure to span. Yeah, so that's but it, it is possible. And the ventilation isn't on that side. Um, we probably might might be clear of the ventilation, but my partner Margarita. Uh, yeah, I think I think you are. I think the issue kind is that you don't want a lot to... of the structure. Okay, yeah, have... I, I'm just trying to figure out if it's possible or not. I don't want to, you know. I mean, sometimes things are not possible, but I think I think it is possible. 
It is possible, but much more uh, invasive on the existing building. Also, uh, the top floor is very tall. So to get to the roof deck, so it becomes a very long stair run. It has uh, to circle back. It doesn't, it doesn't. Right. Fit, so, yeah. It barely fits on. And, and yes, it might even have to have it. Because it's the top floor, as you know, first of all, it's a beautiful building and then it has high ceilings and then it has an attic space. So this is a very long, long run. So doubling back like we've done is the most compact. Uh, it, it's best for utilization of the space available in the building. And um, it works, it's most efficient structurally you know, to, to keep the cost for the nonprofit down. And um, so, and it reinforces uh, what the Landmarks Commission is viewing favorably is that it, it maintains the context of the architecture of the building as a continuous stairway. And it's also best complies with the code requirements. But so okay. kind of... Okay. Respects them historically, but also respects the codes as well. And it's this more straightforward uh, benefit for the building area. Mr. Madison, thank you for that. Heather, I believe they're committed to the plan that they've provided us with. Is it possible for us to just move forward with the vote? Because it's 836. What would you like to do? You can you can move forward. Okay. How many of us are there? Patricia, right? Patricia's on the yeah. Patricia's on the committee. Patricia's here. Alyssa's here. Um, myself, you, and Heather. So it's a total of five of us. That's eight, five. Right. If not, it has to be moved to executive. I'd like to know what are we voting? We, uh, you're voting whether to move it to uh, the full committee. No, I'm not you, Joanna. I'm board. speaking to the committee. I'm speaking to the board, Joanna. Joanna. Yes, so, so, Heather, what are we voting on? Oh okay. um no I think they are they need a letter of support I assume and we had asked them to come back with um a, with an explanation of um or to answer some of the questions that we had asked mm -hmm. and I uh, assume this is still a letter of support for the alterations at the grounds level and on the roof even though they didn't mm -hmm. present the the ground floor changes, but they were presented the last time they were here, and I don't think anyone on the committee had any concerns with uh, with the ground floor changes. Saying that, Liz. Yeah, it's Liz. Oh, Patricia. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> I just want to make sure we're speaking to the committee now, not to not to. Yeah, yep, yep. Trying to get us together. Yeah, no, I'm just refreshing everyone's memory because. This is essentially what I do is looking at proposals like this and um yeah, so I and I know the process of going the landmark. So they they need a letter of support from us on these two changes that the staff staff level is telling them that they need um or that ideally that they have support from the community board before they go in front of the full commission with these proposed changes. Well, I, I understand that. And because it just seems ambiguous that that for instance, last time that I remember them reporting, they gave a very long presentation uh, between the the director and the person doing the construction. That they also spoke spoke about a gate outside. Uh, this is a very small unit, and uh, I'm still kind of unclear. They don't know whether the staircase is spiral. They don't know whether this thing on top is is going to be, uh, they're going to be doing uh, yoga and downward dog amongst uh, stories of buildings that are families. You can even see in the, the actual picture where you could see the families that can look in. So it, it, 
I, I I'd like to uh I'd like for us to to gather and and discuss this within the committee. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh I move I make a motion that we withhold our vote until we get uh uh until we as a committee can discuss it amongst ourselves. What is it to discuss amongst ourselves? That um, we in the, maybe I'm not understanding it, but I'm getting clarity as to because uh first it was a straight staircase and then uh, uh it was a spiral staircase and then it was a seven foot fence outside and then they're talking about making a back door which in that very small structure that without infringing on someone else's property they can't do there's a lot going on here i don't i well, and, and it, 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 what it, is going on is the design that has been presented to us and if it's within the guidelines they have provided us with that information okay. we we can move forward with the throw it's a simple yes or a no okay, okay. If that's fine you go ahead and move forward with the vote that's what you want to do i'm, I'm good okay heather no go ahead you can start with go ahead patricia how do you vote yes or no no um liz how do you vote yes or no yes um Alyssa, how do you vote yes or no no Annette, how do you vote yes or no? Yes. And I vote yes with some modification. Uh, thank you. What modifications would you like? Well, I, I, I'm still not convinced that that staircase cannot be, um, or the bulkhead, I should say, cannot be me to not be visible or to infringe upon the site, the viewing of the neighboring building. Um, Scott and uh, architects, do we need to go like ask the Department of Buildings? Yeah. Um, no, this is not a Department of Buildings question. Uh -huh. We we had we had asked those questions too. To we had asked questions about the height of the bulkhead. Um, the minimum height, I don't believe we received that answer yet, unless it's in this presentation and we just didn't see it. But that's fine. I mean, you're, you're, you're going to get, I think there were enough yes votes for you to get a letter of support. There were three yes votes and two no votes. Yes, thank you. And it still has to go to the full community board, is my yes. understanding. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh-huh. So we can get those more more clarifications if you like, and I would I think um, uh, you know just uh, the uh, the lady who lives in four B said she can't really see it because she looks north. The structure is uh, to the left. No, she looks north. Sorry, she looks west, and the structure is on the you know on her left side, looking out the window. The photos that were taken uh, were actually uh, like they had to go like right to the window and sort of look to the left, sort of lean out a little bit, you know, and so it's not something you normally, I think, see from her living room. Um, but we could go ahead and ask for more pictures. The lady was very uh, uh, cooperative, if you like. Thank you so much. Um, like I said, we, yeah, this is, I think you provide wonderful services for the community and we like to be, you know, to continue to partner with you um, on that. And we we are going to move this to the executive committee and write a letter of support um, for you to move forward with this project. Um, so we're gonna just finish off with the agenda, just make another couple of announcements because we are over our time right now. Um, Unless anyone else has any other questions or comments regarding this. Um, but thank you so much. And, and I agree. I think that you all have been very responsive. And I appreciate the, the number of open houses that you all have done. Um, so thank you so much for including the community. And, and I hope that you'll continue to do so. Thank you but so much. There, for you bring us. much needed services to the community, and that's important. Thank you, Thank you very much. And, and mm -hmm. welcome everybody to visit whenever you can.
Yes, yes, you've been very open and, and welcoming. Thank you. And we appreciate that. Okay, um, just moving the agenda forward, I'll just make the announcement. I don't see um, Claudette Brady on the call, but she was at our um, committee meeting a couple of months ago. Save Harlem now is offering a financial benefits for homeowners in historic districts conference this Saturday from 8.30 to 3 p.m. at the Friendship Baptist Church at 144 West 131st Street. Um, so, and then I don't see UN on the call for West Harlem Historic District or Robert Stern from the Morningside Heights Historic District. So are there any other old business updates or action items? Heather? Go ahead, Liz. I just want to point out with the Save Harlem Now um, event that's taking place uh, this Saturday, if anyone is um, in a building um, in West Harlem between 135th Street and 155th Street between Riverside Drive and the west side of Amsterdam, um, UN's organization um, has been uh, working on uh, working with the city to make that uh, a historic district or at least in part. So if you're in a building in that area, you're the building owner, um, even though you are not currently in a historic district, um, their program would be good for you to understanding um, how the city may financially be able to help you with uh, restoration of your facade or other elements of your building. So um, please spread the word if you know um, <laughs> homeowners of row houses in that area that um, even though they are not currently in a historic district, that it is advantageous for them to understand this information. I'm not saying that their buildings are gonna become uh, in a historic district because Landmarks doesn't wanna do a lot of that anymore, but um, they should inform themselves. And if it makes sense uh, financially to be in a historic district, um, they should know that and they should encourage Landmarks to landmark more of West Harlem. That's all. Thank you so much for that additional information. I've provided the website um, as well as CODA Alliance website so you can find out more about this, their services. And um, that really concludes our agenda. Can we get a motion to- um, I make a motion that we close. Okay, at 8.47 p.m. Somebody has to say. Second, Liz is seconding. Thanks, Patricia. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very so, much. Is there anything else? So oh, then the, the meeting is adjourned then at 8.47 p.m. Sorry, we went over again. I will try to save the chat. Thank and you, it's a great meeting. Thank you to our co-chairs for all of thank your you hard so work in leading the to, meeting. To, to, to everyone, Heather and, and Annette, thank you very much for your diligence. And, and, and everyone, thank you for your participation and for all your questions. It's very helpful. If there's anyone who can help us with these minutes, that would be very helpful to us. Um, so please, um, if anyone will volunteer, that will be greatly appreciated, or we can work together as a small group to catch up with the minutes. <laughs> it would be greatly appreciated because we owe it to our community. So I will go ahead and stop. Um, let's see. Let me stop the recording. Okay. <laughs>